Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we have a special update with the CDC's Dr. Hannah Kirking to clarify information about the types of spread with COVID-19. Dr. Kirking is a medical epidemiologist in the CDC's Division of Viral Diseases. She's been working on the CDC's COVID-19 response since early January, specifically on the epidemiologic investigations. She joins us from Atlanta. I'm Todd Unger in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Kirking, as states across the country open and we continue to see rising numbers in many of them, conversations about ho how COVID-19 spreads and what we can do to better contain the virus are particularly critical right now. One question uh, that came, it's about uh, transmission guidelines on surfaces. And I think there was some confusion uh, regarding uh, when the CDC edited its guidelines. Can you talk a little bit about that and clarify uh, how uh, likely is it that people will get COVID through touch? Yeah, Todd, I think that's a good question. Um, I think to start with, and first and foremost, uh, COVID-19 is caused by SARS-CoV-2, which is a virus that spreads by, by respiratory droplets. Um, and so primor primarily most cases are due to respiratory spread of this through human to human transmission. So wanted to put that out there that overwhelming majority is human to human. Having said that, the question of transmission via surfaces has come up quite a bit. Um, and there's some data that's starting to answer some of these questions, but definitely we have much more to learn with, with the role that surfaces make in terms of transmission. So specifically, I guess I would say there's some studies out there. Many of them were done in a laboratory setting and not necessarily in the real world setting. And so there's nuances with how to interpret the results from some of these studies. I think most notably, there was a study published in New England Journal of Medicine back in April. Um, the study was done by the National Institutes of Health, and it looked at different surfaces um, and their ability to have the virus remain viable when on the surface. Um, that study showed that the viable can remain vi or the virus can remain viable for a certain amount of time. Um, depending on what the surface was, it was somewhere between eight hours and 72 hours. Having said that, um, I think there's some practical approaches that we definitely recommend, despite the fact there's some outstanding questions. Um, I think coronaviruses are not particularly hardy viruses in the environment, such that if they are on surfaces, disinfections and or time on the surface um, quickly does make them less viable. So despite the questions still out there, um, we think this is a respiratory virus um, mostly, um, and if there are some surface transmissions, disinfection is probably very effective at, at taking care of the virus and reducing transmission from that route. So based on what we know, what should physicians be communicating to their patients? Uh, you know, should I be wiping off my groceries and packages and takeout containers or, you know, think about going out to a restaurant now? Uh, am I to be concerned about touching glasses and utensils and other kind of shared items? Yeah, it's an important question because I think uh, my colleagues or frontline providers are getting these kind of practical, what do I do with this, this recommendation? How do I bring it into my life? Um, questions every day. I think the practically speaking, what I would say is that if you're getting packages, whether it's in the mail or carry out food or whatever it might be, or groceries, um, wiping it down if it's soiled is by all means very practical and, and washing things before you eat them continue to follow all of those regular recommendations. I don't know that you have to go through heroics to, to clean packages or do more because I think that transmission risk from that is fairly limited. Having said that, you know, going out and sharing utensils and dishes and, and plates and things like that, by all means, clean them. Restaurants or in, even in people's personal homes, hopefully are doing that all the time for all kinds of different pathogens. And so just maintaining a, a ongoing high level of quality of cleaning is, is the important part to that. Okay, so uh, you said before that the primary and, and most important mode of transmission for COVID-19 is through kind of close contact uh, from person to person. So can you elaborate on the science behind this kind of transmission and, and what does it mean as states struggle with reopening? Yeah, I think with, with knowing that the primary form of transmission is person to person, I think the what this means right now is that social distancing is the number one way to prevent transmission. And so essentially um, the person to person transmission is essentially when someone talks or speaks or coughs, they create little droplets. Um, and that social distancing 
um, essentially limits your ability to be hit with anyone else's droplet. If that droplet, you know, is either inhaled by someone or hits mucous membranes, that's when transmission occurs. So the mainstay remains social distancing, which means keeping six people or six feet um, from other people, as well as minimizing the number of people that you come into contact with. The other thing that it means is wearing masks, which um, are face coverings is what, what we should be calling them. Um, that essentially reduces, if someone might be sick, whether they know it or not, it reduces their ability to transmit the virus to others. We call it source control, typically. Why do you think there is so much resistance to wearing face coverings at this point? I think I think it's a couple of things. Um, you know, I think culturally Americans aren't used to wearing face coverings. Um, and and it, 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 it's a major change to how we have operated in our normal uh, everyday environments after some time. Um, I think, you know, from working in hospitals and healthcare settings where various times we do put on masks, um, it, it does get normal with time. I don't think about it when I'm in a hospital and I think I'm getting to the point now in the world where I'm not thinking about it outside of the hospital either. Um, but, it, but I think it's a, a, a cultural thing and an adjustment for everyone. And, and I think as we've seen this pandemic change, um, I'm hopeful that, that we all start to realize and, and use the face coverings because it's a practical approach to reducing transmission. And is that guidance, you know, basically when you go outside and you're going to be near other people, wear a mask? Is it pretty straightforward like that? I think there's there's nuances to it. I think if you are going to be around people who are outside of, of your inner circle or your regular household contacts, wearing a mask is, is good practice. Um, I think if you're outside um, totally by yourself, that you probably don't need to wear the mask. If you're able to maintain good social distancing practices and keep your distance from people, by all means, I think, use your, use your uh, decision-making skills on that. But if you're going to come into contact with other people or if you're in settings where you're unable to maintain six feet distance, definitely the recommendation is to wear a face covering. Uh, so we're you know, now approaching mid-July and we're obviously not seeing the decrease in numbers that we had hoped for, certainly in, st in some states. Um, can you take us through a few of the common high risk and low risk scenarios that can help people make more informed decisions throughout the summer? Yeah, I think the fact that it's summer is actually uh, really nice right now. Um, summer is a good time to spend time outside in my mind. And I think right now, the number one thing that, that people can do to still be able to enjoy their summer but reduce their risk is probably spend as much time outside as they can. Um, just by nature of, of how things will get distributed if you're outside, um, that reduces your risk quite a bit. I know personally, I've been taking early morning walks around the park near my house, doing much more hiking and kayaking than normal just because all of those activities lend themselves to, to keeping my distance from other people, but also maybe doing them in smaller groups. Um, I think crowds are something that, that right now I would definitely recommend that we be avoiding, um, specifically indoor crowds or, or con areas where people congregate, but also to some extent outdoors as well, just because it's you're unable to maintain that social distance of six feet if you're in a large group of people. I think on the higher end of the spectrum would be indoor activities with many people. Um, and that's twofold. You can't maintain social distancing of six feet, of six feet um, when you're with many people in an indoor setting. And then also the, the, um, your, your likelihood of coming into contact with people who you're less familiar with or, that, or more people, which naturally will increase your risk, is, is heightened when you're indoors. What else uh, can physicians and the public do to help contain the virus at this point? I think the, I mean, I think the mainstay of what we're doing right now and trying to get um, people to do is maintain the social distancing, wear face coverings um, when needed or when appropriate. And the other thing we haven't talked a whole lot about is really good hand hygiene. You know, our hands are our way of in, interacting with the environment and you ask questions about surface transmission and, you know, even surface transmission typically comes via our hands. And so it sounds like an old kindergarten adage, but like wash your hands is still largely really good advice for us. 
So I know that uh, you've dealt with a lot of misinformation uh, in the media and uh, you know confusing guidance from a huge uh, number of sources. It's been a challenge. Are there any other misperceptions that you want to clarify? I think the biggest thing just to clarify, and I don't know if it's a misperception or just kind of a, in efforts to be transparent about the various recommendations. In public health, we're, we're frequently very well accustomed to what we call a risk mitigation strategy or approach. And essentially what that means is any one intervention or strategy that we recommend is never going to be perfect, but it's going to do something to either reduce, to do risk reduction or reduce risk of transmission in this case. Um, I had a medical school professor who once told us on a multiple choice exam, the answer that says always or never is never the right answer because the world doesn't operate in that way. It's never black and white. And I think right now with COVID, you know, social distancing is probably not 100%, but it's pretty good. Face coverings are probably not 100%, but they're adding another layer of protection. Um, being outdoors might be a way of adding a third layer to reduce risk. And so sometimes when it seems we want a, an easy fix for this pandemic, um, I don't think we have one and therefore layering on the different strategies is really what will help us reduce transmission and hopefully keep more people safe. Well, thank you very much uh, for being with us here today. I'm sure you very got your, got your hands full, so to speak. Um, we appreciate you sharing your perspectives and guidance and clarifying uh, those misperceptions. That's it for today's COVID-19 update. We'll be back tomorrow with another segment. For updated resources on COVID-19, go to ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us today and take care. Thank you.